I hope you can all see my slides and you can hear me well, signal if that's not the case. Uh, so I would first of all like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to, talk, to talk to you and give you this, uh, and this talk, which will be kind of a teaser for all the wonderful science that you are gonna hear about uh, during uh, the rest of this week. So let's jump into it. Uh, so, as Leo also uh, previously said, mid infrared is often considered kind of a niche uh, a part of uh, a wavelength range because mainly because of the complications that are caused by the fact that we have the Earth's atmosphere, which is absorbing uh, most of the light in this range, and the fact that everything around us is actually emitting uh, a thermal radiation in this wavelength regime. And so, there are some specific wavelength windows that. Um, that the atmosphere is uh, allowing us uh, to, to see. And these are marked here roughly as LM and, and uh, Q band. And basically long words from 25 micrometers, uh, even at the best of uh, uh, sites that we have for astronomy, um, the atmosphere is really prohibitive for, uh, for the observations. Um, unless you have uh, uh, something like SOFIA, for those who don't know, SOFIA is a is a telescope that is sitting on a plane that is flying very high in the atmosphere and is ba basically flying on top of the main bulk of the atmosphere. And then thus we have the opportunity actually to see uh, even longer wavelengths uh, from something that is conditionally called also a ground-based uh, facility. Uh, now I try to, to, to kind of um, make a summary of all the instrumentation that we have available at the moment. Uh, in, in yellow, I hope I didn't miss uh, anything major. Uh, in yellow, I, I mark uh, all the active instruments and, and in, in red, I mark those that have been retired. But as you will see, I always, during this talk, I will mention which instrument was used for, used for particular discovery. And even these retired instruments uh, uh, will play an active role. And this is because of all the archives uh, that are really well maintained these days, so we can actually take the opportunity and looking uh, into the data that have maybe been taken uh, even a while ago. Uh, so what do we actually see in the mid infrared, in the thermal infrared? Well, lots of things, of course. Uh, we can see if sufficiently warm a gas phase uh, where we can see atomic transitions and uh, mostly molecular transitions, which are mostly in this case due to rotation uh, and vibrational excitations. We see ices uh, in cool environments. So uh, here I'm showing um, an example towards a few, a few protostars with a, with a large number of different uh, ice species. And of course, we see the dust. Um, we see the dust, we see uh, the, the PAH, most commonly the uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And as, as we can see in this, uh, another star forming uh, region. What emits in the thermal infrared? Well, the answer, I guess, is everything. Um, but here is a list of topics that I'm going to uh, mostly touch during this talk. So from solar, solar system objects, stars, both young and involved, exoplanets, brown dwarfs, protoplanetary disks, galactic center, extragalactic sources. I acknowledge that I will mostly talk about the AGNs, although there are other extragalactic sources that are mid infrared emitters, for example, star forming galaxies. Uh, and there are definitely more interesting topics that I haven't mentioned here. Now I have two disclaimers or basically putting into context. So you can imagine that, that putting all these uh, topics into a relatively short talk um, can be challenging. So I had to kind of restrict myself into what I put into the talk and whatnot. And so, uh, Basically, since the, 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 the conference is, is dedicated to ground-based mid infrared instrument, instrumentation, I will only uh, cite the papers and talk about the work done with these kinds of facilities. But of course, we have to acknowledge that uh, great progress has also been provided by the mid infrared space facilities. And another thing is that uh, one single wavelength range is probably not, in most cases, not enough to provide a full picture of an object phenomena. So the synergy between the mid infrared and other uh, wavelength ranges, of course, is, is crucial to, to achieve many of the science goals. Also, I have made my uh, definition of recent. So I, I, I kind of uh, wanted to 
um, to, to concentrate on only on the most recent science. And in this case, this would be the last five years mostly, and eventually, eventually 10. All right, so let's jump into it. The first topic that I'm gonna cover is the solar system. And I will start there with the small bodies of the solar system, and in particular with the comets. So comets, as well as asteroids and trans-Neptunian objects, they're all survivors from the early days of our solar system and the, and the planet formation process. Now, uh, comets may be responsible for replenishing uh, the inner part of the solar system with all these kinds of volatile species that I'm uh, listing here. And according to the solar system formation models, comets may have formed in two different regions of the protoplanetary disk, which would be characterized by different properties, by different temperature, UV radiation, uh, etc. And this should be actually imprinted on the icy material of the comets, uh, both, the, both from the Oort cloud and, and from the Jupiter family comets. And one of these I'm showing here, so these are the high resolution infrared spectra uh, of two classes of these comets. Um, and uh, this is something that is still being uh, heavily researched. Are, these, are there any systematic uh, differences between uh, the Jupiter family uh, and the Oort uh, cloud comets? Uh, at longer wavelengths, so in addition to the uh, thermal uh, emission from the silicates and carbon that you can see in this model in the, uh, in the, in, uh, shown with the red line in the right-hand plot, uh, we also find some un unidentified bands. And in this case, for this comet 21P Jacobini Zinner, they may, uh, may probably be attributed to complex uh, organic uh, molecules. So comets are, are holding lots of uh, secrets uh, still. Um, uh, asteroids, so jumping to another uh, type of small bodies, um, are really uh, mid infrared data for the astro asteroids are crucial to obtain their thermophysical properties. Why? Because the optical light curves of the asteroids um, allow to constrain their, their, uh, their shapes and their spins. However, these models are then scale free and really the measurements of albedo uh, which are provided by the mid infrared data are crucial to obtain the thermophysical properties. So I'm, I'm giving a, just, I picked one example of this so-called Halloween asteroids, asteroid, which was, is called like that, uh, well, I guess for the obvious reasons, um, is the one that uh, swing really close by at just 1.3 lunar distances. And without the thermal uh, emission, thermal data, the size estimates were more than, was more than three uh, times smaller than uh, this object really is. And you can imagine for something that is potentially threatening to Earth, this kind of estimates would uh, be very, very, very important uh, to, have, to have. Now, gas giants have also been regularly observed from the ground because they are um, basically these, the M and, uh, and longer bands are complementary to all the space missions that do not have necessarily this capability. And we will hear more about this uh, I believe this afternoon or tomorrow um, from Lee Fletcher. And uh, mid infrared for, for the planets is, for the giant uh, planets is, is providing very powerful diagnostic of their uh, atmospheric conditions, of the temperatures, uh, composition, uh, cloud opacities, cloud dynamics, etc. And uh, high resolution spectroscopy, which is actually, these are compositional maps uh, uh, pro, um, obtained from high, high resolution spectroscopy. Uh, show, for example, in this case, I'm just showing the region around the great uh, red spot, uh, showing, for example, local enhancements of uh, phosphine and aerosols in this particular uh, region. Now, Mars has also been observed uh, from the ground, and despite all the probes that we actually sent to Mars, to, uh, we still don't know all the different species that may make up uh, its atmosphere. This is what is shown in this complicated <laughs> Uh, plot on the right hand side. Uh, the yellow ones are actually those that have been known, uh, uh, found in, in Martian atmosphere until uh, this particular paper. Um, and one that I'm going to stress, which is a methane whose discovery led to much discussion. This is still a discussion if the methane, uh, if the origin of methane uh, on Mars would be biological or uh, geological. And so 7.5. Uh, line, micrometer line uh, that I'm showing here is actually particularly suitable uh, due to the low contamination by terrestrial uh, methane, which you can see here um, very strongly uh, 
contributing at 3.3 uh, micrometers. All right, now moving from, uh, from our solar system towards uh, other stellar systems, uh, I will talk uh, shortly about the extrasolar planets and brown dwarfs. Um, well, the thermal uh, imaging is, uh, has a very important role in the studies of uh, exoplanets. Exoplanets are cool, they emit mostly in the, in the mid infrared. This is what is actually shown, in, represented in both of these plots here. You see that as you go cooler, so these are uh, objects with, dif with uh, different temperatures, uh, as you go cooler, the, uh, the um, contribution of the uh, mid-infrared uh, bands to the, to the total luminosity of, of a planet, uh, it becomes more and more important. And as stars uh, are emit less in mid-infrared uh, wavelengths, then this allows us to achieve favorable flux contrast uh, in, in these particular bands. Now, L-band uh, uh, contains very important, very uh, important information about the chemical uh, composition and cloud configurations of, of these planets and can also help break the generacies between the temperature uh, and other parameters. So for example, I am showing one, uh, well, I'm showing one example here of a particular planet called GJ504b, in which uh, in blue we are seeing the best fit, uh, best fit model. Um, and, and, and then uh, they vary slightly all the different properties. So temperature, uh, surface gravity, metallicity, and the cloud properties. And as you can see from the, for example, the uh, temperature will mostly affect the L-band um, and, and metallicity will change, will affect both J, uh, K, and L band, etc. Now, if you look, uh, for example, at the metallicity, changing the metallicity or increasing the metallicity will push the K band flux uh, uh, up, while it will push at the same time the L band flux down. And the cloud properties will, uh, will change the two, um, the both bands in the same direction. So this helps actually break what I said, just breaking the generacy between these uh, different uh, parameters. I've tried to, to assemble um, kind of a, 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 a table, a list of exoplanets, more of, of the largest exoplanet surveys in the L and M bands in the about in the last 10 years. I hope again, I didn't miss uh, anything. So as you can see, several hundreds of stars have been uh, surveyed so uh, so far in these bands uh, with different instruments at different telescopes and spanning all uh, spectral ranges basically from B uh, to the to the M band. Now the the uh, I will only mention uh, in more details one of them, uh, which which is the Leach survey, which uh, uh, re published recently the the, the, the first results. And statistical results from their uh, from their survey, so they basically set a conservative upper limit of 90% uh, of for the eight, uh, F, G, and K systems hosting seven to ten Jupiter mass planets at five to fifty AU. So the, well, this is an upper limit, but still it means that uh, it leaves the possibility that these uh, planets are quite uh, common. Um, Mid infrared is also uh, very important in studying uh, brown dwarfs. Uh, you can imagine brown dwarfs are very cool objects. And here I'm showing the mid infrared spectra of the coldest uh, uh, brown dwarfs, um, a brown dwarf, sorry. Um, and this it's called WISE 0855. So while space based observatory like, observatories like WISE have been crucial in, in, uh, in discovering these objects, ground-based facilities are again providing a very important means for characterizing them. So one what can see uh, the L-band uh, here compared to Jupiter uh, for in, in red and here the M-band as well for the same objects compared to other very cool, uh, very cool objects. And as you can see in, in the M-band, um, the, the, the spectrum is, is dominated by the water absorption and shows a clear lack of phosphine when compared uh, to Jupiter. So these are uh, extremely interesting object, objects, very cool. So something like a room temperature, uh, a room temperature type of uh, uh, atmospheres. 
Now I'm going to now jump uh, towards the protoplanetary disk, and in fact, this is kind of a, a connection between disks and, and planets. I think this is maybe one of the most spectacular results we, we've had in the last few years. Um, this is a, a planet or protoplanet uh, uh, found in a gap of a transitional disk. It's called PDS-70b. It's really a planet caught uh, information, which is also evidenced by the H alpha emission, which has been observed in the optical, which signals actually active accretion onto this planet. And, and then uh, it has been also found that there is another uh, planet in this uh, same system. And the mass of PDS-70b uh, is estimated to be somewhere between uh, four and seven uh, Jupiter masses. Now, uh, we can also look uh, into the inner regions of protoplanetary disks um, by the means of HR, uh, HR spectroscopy. So, for example, using the CO row vibrational lines at 4.7 uh, micrometers, which need warm and dense molecular gas within only a few AU from the start to be excited. So, we are pro probing with these kinds of line, lines very particular kinds of uh, uh, environments close. Uh, to the stars and the line shapes and flux ratio between uh, different lines of the same species can tell us about the location and the temperature well, conditions uh, at which um, these lines originate. And this can be viewed in context of disk dispersal and the planet uh, formation uh, mechanisms such as uh, being done in this uh, particular work. And the same goes uh, for the water. Uh, water has also been uh, surveyed towards the inner parts of the protoplanetary disks, and uh, we find that uh, water is actually a common uh, constituent of the uh, of uh, of the inner regions of the disk of the T uh, classical T Tauri disk, and uh, uh, similar to the CO emitted from a few AU regions of, of these disks. Um, <clears throat> Now, uh, talking about uh, Herbig AE, uh, BE star disks. So, based on their SCDs, these disks have been divided uh, typically into two groups. Uh, group one uh, were the so called flaring disks, and group two, flat disks. Uh, the group one disks uh, were known to have gaps, but for the, the group two disks, it was uh, long thought that this should be uh, gapless. Uh, however, uh, observations with the mid infrared interferometry actually discovered uh, a new class of group two disks, so these are flat disks that actually do have gaps. And this is here indicated as the yellow. These are radio in yellow, these are radiative transfer models uh, with, for the disks uh, with, uh, with gaps. Now, uh, there are uh, now there is, I put here this big question mark because it's uh, really. Uh, still unknown what, what is real, really the nature, what would be evolutionary uh, sequence of this opening of the gaps in, in this particular disk. So uh, there are here, as in this paper, they propose two uh, possibilities that group two disks may be precursors of group one disks, or actually we could have a parallel evolution of gaps and pot potentially having uh, some uh, common and sense ancestor uh, for the two types of disk, but what would be the nature of this ancestor uh, is really uh, still unknown. Now, the T-Tori disks uh, have also been observed uh, uh, with MIDI at, at the VLTI, and what is found is uh, that uh, T-Tori disks are cooler and they tend to be more extended with respect uh, to the stellar luminosity when compared to the Herbig uh, AE uh, disks shown here in blue in this plot. Uh, and another thing that has been uh, also noticed for the Titori disk is that there are, uh, there are gaps. So the gaps in these disks, uh, again, are quite common, which is signaled here by this green region in this plot. I think we are going to hear uh, more about all of this um, uh, later today. Um, another very, very interesting topic that have uh, emerged in the recent years are the observation of exozodiacal dust. So this is dust that is coming basically from the innermost and hottest parts of the debris disks. 
uh, only a few, uh, again, a few AU from the star. And uh, I'm mentioning here the hosts, uh, Steve Ertel will talk more about that, uh, which is a survey that is looking for observ observable signatures of ter terrestrial systems uh, with the L LBTI. So what they find is that most stars uh, with a detection of uh, Zodi uh, dust also host uh, coal dust uh, uh, in their systems, i.e. the outer debris disks. So uh, the inner disk may be replenished by either by dust delivery by the comets uh, from these outer uh, disks or by uh, possibly by the pointing Robertson track. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this other plot that I'm showing is the first uh, detection of exozodis in the L-band uh, with the Matisse uh, at the VLTI. Uh, this is, I guess, the only result I'm showing here uh, from Matisse, but uh, since this is a relatively, well, it's a very new instrument, I'm sure we are going to hear much more about it and the new results uh, during the rest uh, of the conference. Uh, massive stars have, of course, been also observed uh, heavily in the mid infrared. We know that there is a long standing debate. Uh, about the formation mechanisms uh, of uh, massive stars and uh, the new results by the mid-infrared observations in generally, in general speaking, favor of accretion via disk. So something similar to the formation mechanisms of low mass stars. So for example, uh, from mid-infrared mid uh, mid, uh, interferometric data show that there are significant deviations from the spherical uh, symmetry at mid infrared wavelengths, which can be attributed either to disks or outflow. So I guess probably the new data are needed to, um, to show what is the real nature of these asymmetries. Um, but in principle, uh, also an uh, another uh, survey, which is a SOMA survey observed by Sophia, also uh, uh, finds uh, the results are also consistent with, uh, with the uh, massive star formation being similar uh, to actually to low, star, low mass star formation sense that it, uh, it proceeds via this uh, accretion. Now jumping from the young stars to uh, more evolved uh, stars, and we know that uh, evolved stars are really what they call the dust factories. So these are probably the, the, the main uh, suppliers of the dust in the universe. And this, the, the, the both, so these are all stars that are normally uh, both um, they're found in the cool upper sector of the HR diagram. So red giants, super giants, AGB stars, protoplanetary nebulas, et cetera. And also the hot and hostile uh, stellar environments. So this would be wolf Rayet stars, luminous blue variables, and things like uh, Eta Carina. Um, so uh, we probably all, you probably all heard about this uh, event that was a relatively recent event of the sudden dimming of the Betelgeuse here shown actually in the in the uh, in the optical and that, but Betelgeuse has also been uh, observed uh, readily in the mid infrared and this is was probably this outburst has probably been uh, due to a dust that has been uh, ejected in a particular in a particular direction that is, uh, well, happens to be along our line of sight. And we will hear, um, we will have a dedicated talk uh, to this event uh, during this conference. Uh, AGB stars, AGB stars are, uh, there are really many questions regarding the mass loss mechanism and their uh, atmospheric abundance. There are many uh, things that they are, that will, uh, that still need an explanation over the next years. Uh, for example, um, it has been found that the uh, that the asymmetric structure uh, on, on uh, that are found on the spatial scales on a few stellar radii are really produced in very very inner uh, parts of the dust forming regions. But the origin of these uh, uh, or of these asymmetries again is not uh, is not known. So it may, they may be dust clumps or circumstellar disks as found by uh, by observations by, with MIDI. I said also the abundances are uh, so the the uh, uh, atmospheric uh, abundances for these stars are also largely unknown and uh, normally the chemical equilibrium predictions uh, fit quite well the spectra except in some cases and here for example uh, ammonia and just stressing the ammonia 
molecule which actually uh, where the abundances are uh, uh, several orders of magnitude uh, higher than what is predicted by the uh, by the uh, predictions of, of chemical equilibrium. Uh, Kora, three minutes, please. Uh, yeah, I'm almost done. Uh, so, um, luminous blue variables have also been uh, observed uh, in the in uh, in the mid infrared. These are very evolved, massive stars. They exhibit uh, instabilities which are really not yet understood, and they eject huge amounts of material. They can eject few solar masses during their lifetimes, and from these. Uh, recent observations of, of R71 LBV that uh, that had a particularly strong outburst which started uh, uh, 2000, in 2012. We see that from uh, from N and Q bands that, that we witnessed probably a dust cooling and grain evolution at the, at the larger radius from away from the stars star, but in the N band we are probably seeing a newly formed uh, born dust. And supernovae are also uh, very powerful dust factories and uh, however it was largely unknown how much of this dust may have been destroyed by the shocks right and so what we see here from both from the relatively old and young uh, supernova remnants that dust can indeed survive the passage of the reverse shock and they can even uh, be reformed and grow in this false shock region all right galactic center so I'm jumping from topic to topic. I have a few minutes left. Um, so galactic center is a, is a very well it came again to the center of our attention with the Nobel Prize, recent Nobel Prize. Uh, Sophia has looked in these uh, large regions around the, the center uh, of the galaxy, uh, where where we have a very particular environment, and we know that the global star formation uh, rate uh, should be more than order uh, of magnitude larger when we would look at the amount of the molecular uh, oops, sorry i put my alarm <laughs> to signal me when i have to finish and now i'm over time i apologize for that uh, we also uh, looked um, into the very central uh, part of the milky way so there is a long tradition of observations ln and bands which reveal a wealth of dusty structures uh, for example uh, this x7 uh, bow shock structure or the G so-called G clouds whose nature is really still a matter uh, of debate. Uh, what do what else do we see in the central parsec of the Milky Way? We will have a dedicated talk again uh, uh, to this particular topic. We see um, a lot of uh, these dust and dust streamers and thanks to the polarimetric capability of uh, the GTC we can also see uh, actually the structure of the magnetic fields uh, connected to these dust streamers uh, at the center. And now arriving to the last topic uh, of my talk, which are agents, last but not the least, uh, I, I here I, I, I present a list of uh, some uh, major uh, mid-infrared observational catalogs that appeared in the last, uh, last 10 years. So you can see that hundreds of agents have been, have been um, observed from L towards the Q band and I'm going to highlight a few results. So for example here uh, we know now that the mid infrared, infrared emission seems to be dominated by a polar structure on parsec scale. So what we see in this plot is basically that the sources that are showing elongated mid infrared emission also tend to pre preferentially be extended uh, in the polar uh, direction. Uh, and the classical picture of the geometrical effectors may be only may only work in the inner region where we have the near infrared emission, while the mid infrared emission is coming from dusty clouds or filaments in the uh, polar region. And the same is actually seen on a larger scale, so in tens to hundred uh, parts of, parsecs of scale. And uh, really this means that uh, the uh, agents need, uh, there is a clear need from a, for a new paradigm when compared to the old paradigm of the dusty torus uh, with different viewing uh, angles. I will just stress one uh, of particular case, uh, which is the Circinus galaxy, uh, where, which, uh, where the modeling uh, is showing that a hollow cone, so this is a model of a hollow cone, and the accretion disk um, in, the, in the center is both reproducing the SCDs uh, and the morphology. Finally, 
there is also a long standing debate about the connection between the AGNs and star formation. And I think this is something that is still uh, needs to be resolved in the future. Uh, basically, there is still no consensus uh, uh, if the small scale PAH emission is coming, uh, is due to the star formation that is concentrated in the nuclear regions of the AGNs, or it may be due to the actually AGN radiation, uh, radiation field. So this is some, something to look, uh, uh, to look uh, for in the future. And this brings me to my final slides with my conclusions and the outlook. I hope I have managed to convince you uh, that the thermal infrared is really a unique wavelength domain, domain which help us to uncover different physical processes in a wide variety of astrophysical environments. And uh, during this conference, we will, uh, we will hear about uh, all these different, uh, <clears throat> not only about the science that is, uh, that is of course the main driver of the uh, technological um, uh, improvements, but we will hear about also about all these new uh, instruments on large telescopes, different technical improvements that we need uh, to improve our observations. And of, and of course, uh, about all the novel instrumentation projects that uh, help us uh, go forward in this well energy. And thank you very much. And I apologize for going over time. Thank you, Kuba, for a really very good overview. So that is, I think, a really good introduction for the whole conference. We will hear more about all of these topics. This exactly. has been very, very condensed now, but a very good overview. We have time for one or two very short questions as we're already a bit over time. Um, anyone had a quick question, then raise your hand now or actually all the just unmute uh, if you like, or else we continue the discussions in the general channel on this topic on the Slack. People are still waking up, I guess. <laughs> I think for me, it was also the, the earliest talk I've ever given. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it another moment. What has been, let me ask a question in the meantime, what do you think is the most fancy, the most fantastic result <laughs> with infrared astronomy that you have seen when studying all of these topics? I don't know, that's a, that's a very, very, very tough question. Uh, I have been quite impressed actually with the AGNs, although this is so uh, so far from uh, what I normally do. I am not so familiar with it, but I think um, this uh, AGN paradigm of the torus and things is something that we have all learned for a very long time. And I'm still teaching it to my students and I definitely have to stop doing that. So maybe I would highlight that. Um, Protoplanets just... for me as well. Yeah. The AGN answer is of course the correct answer. 